now to the extent you'd like, some discussion about why does that not happen uh, uh, in India with respect to uh, the compulsory licensing setting? Because we, I think, all seem to agree that people dying is not the desired outcome. And I think we all seem to agree that the people whose job it is to make money with all other things being equal like to make money. So, but, but if they can price discriminate, it seems like they would be able to make money and save lives at the same time. That sounds like a win-win. And what, I, what might help us figure out is why that win-win can't occur, why those gains from trades can't occur, why that dead weight loss can't be recovered uh, into a productive society. Uh, uh, is, it, uh, is it that property rights and contracts are not recognized? Is it that contracts of that type are not allowed? Is it that if you charge different prices, you, uh, you peg yourself as a, as a favoritist? Uh, or is it, how, how, can you help us? I don't know if anyone wants to offer any thinking on this now. Please let us know. Uh, yeah, please, Mr. Shaw. It's already happening. But there are few companies that we make. Merck, with its latest, latest anti-diabetic drug, has priced in, in India at almost 70% of its price in the US. He's asking within India. No, I'm... Yes, I mean, in other words, uh, wouldn't, wouldn't... Within India, of course, there is a wide range. Uh, because for each generic product, there are 100 manufacturers, and price range varies from 1 to 100. It's a huge price range. But even patented product, GSK has announced publicly that it would adopt a differential pricing policy for the developing world, and including India. And both of these companies have been extremely well in India. Roche has adopted a different model, as I say, going with another Indian manufacturer and offering their patented product. <coughs> so this obviates the need for compulsory licenses. So are you, are you then saying that, that if, if price discrimination is allowed, there would, there would not be the, the affirmative case, if you will, for, for compulsory licensing? Of course. Uh, please, whoever would like. Yes, Mr. Subramanian. Uh, uh, so, so just to be clear, uh, I mean, uh, there's an inter-country price discrimination and an intra-country price discrimination, yes. right? Uh, and I think the the inter-country price discrimination uh, part of the problem, I think, which probably is, is the is the bigger problem, is uh, pharmaceutical companies are loath to see the repercussions in their own markets of having a drug sold so cheaply overseas. Uh, I think that comes back uh, to, to bite them. One, and also, you know, if you have differential pricing, you also have to prevent exports of these to third countries. So, so I think uh, th that's a problem with, with, with in inter-country pricing that, uh, uh, for example, in, in, in the Roche case, I think, as part of the voluntary licenses that we gave to Indian companies, I, I think uh, companies were prevented from exporting. So are you, are you saying, Mr. Uh, or Dr. Superman, uh, that that uh, that in your in your thinking about the economics, you're you're open to the idea that, that as a matter of economics, it would in fact maybe be socially, domestically and internationally quite optimal yeah. to have to have price discriminating yeah. uh, uh, effects, even with say fairly strong enforcement of IP but that if that were to occur, it would be <coughs> necessary for the uh, public dialogue uh, to celebrate it rather than to condemn it, which is to say to uh, speak not uh, for ad advocates who want to uh, uh, encourage access to <coughs> champion it as a path to access rather than to condemn it as uh, Hey, look, uh, this is not fair. One person's getting a lower price than somebody else. No, but, but, but you see, but, but remember, you, you, can have, you can have two kinds of uh, price discrimination. You can have uh, price discrimination where the monopolist has the monopoly in both markets, mm -hmm. and price discrimination where he doesn't have a monopoly in the poorer markets. 
I, I think the, 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 the I think the problem is I think affordability advocates want the latter, and, and, and so which goes against the the the, 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 the monopoly owner is the former. First of all, there are the only two options, right? Couldn't couldn't um, there be a domestic producer, domestic distributor uh, that has the ability to exclude other or license with other domestic distributors that has some relationship with some foreign entity or not? Sure, sure, but but point is that the the, the two-tier monopoly price might still be too high from an affordability perspective and a public policy perspective. So so that's why they wouldn't want to do it and have compulsory licensing. Yeah, absolutely in two-tier, but of course, as we saw in Air India, it sounds like they're like five tiers, right? They <laughs> yeah. could presumably have a thousand tiers, right? Right. So I'm sorry, Mr. Elliott, did you want to, you were going to say something? Sure, I was just going to jump in there very quickly on two points. Firstly, with respect to compulsory licenses, from, from, from what we can calculate, there have been approximately a dozen or so compulsory licenses around the planet before this one. Um, and they were all uh, in the area of HIV or anthrax. Uh, with the one exception, I think there was one involving erectile dysfunction. Uh, it's difficult seeing a national emergency there, but no worries. Um So this is something of an outlier to suggest that this was done as a pricing mechanism um, to, to achieve a certain price and using a pulsing glasses to achieve that. Uh, is certainly, I don't think, what was intended uh, through, the, through the TRIPS process and the <coughs> sign up to TRIPS, I don't think, had that in mind. Um, the, thing, the other thing I think we need to keep in mind here, and I'm sure the pharmaceutical folks will be able to provide more detail on this, is that part of the balance that needs to be found here is that if you look where modern medicine is going and modern treatments are going, they deal with smaller and smaller patient populations. Uh, and this is what's happening here. Once upon a time, there may have been one treatment where it be chemotherapy for all cancers. Now we are looking at particular cancer types and tumor types where particular treatments are going to be effective, which means it's a very, very small patient population and the cost gets larger. And that's, that's the struggle, and that's, the, that's what we're trying to wrestle with here. Well, I, I see that there are more comments, so please just I invite follow-up in the post-hearing. Uh, I'm, I'm unfortunately out of time, and I'll, I'll just also ask uh, in the post-hearing if, if anyone could explain whether um, trip compliance um, uh, could coexist with the trade barrier, which is to say you could be trip compliant, but, but still maybe not be so good, uh, if, or, or maybe be great if you're trip compliant, so you could follow up on that. Thanks so much. Thank you. Not for now, but I guess you could, in, in making that comment, you could also question the, the economic impact versus the trips compliance part of it. Um, but actually, I want to turn to a different topic. And I was wondering, uh, how do the policies at the, at the sub-national level in India affect some of your assessments? And in which policy areas are maybe sub-national entities in the states? Uh, either more restrictive or less restrictive at the national level, and to what extent are you know, particular industries facing uh, requirements in different states that are aimed at foreign firms? So I'm, one thing we have to do is look at you know, the, the national policies, but each of the you know, states would have to, uh, may have different policies that are relevant here. And so I wanted to get into uh, some distinction of the differences in the happy different states. I know one person mentioned Bangladore. So I'm going to open to anybody else. Uh, I'll jump in here. So I, I think there are, you know, under the Constitution, there are some policies that are decided by the center, some by the states, and some that are shared. Um, so on the central policies, there can be no difference, but uh, or, or on others, there can be. Now, uh, it turns out that in India, uh, the states that have performed better, you know, like you know, generally the coastal states, are generally those states that have had provided better conditions for investment, uh, had better education, you know, all, all, all the better policies. So, um, uh, so, so going forward, I think uh, the lesson that you know, some of us draw about India is to encourage this competition between states 
so that you know if you do well you attract the investment if you do good things you attract the investment and, and, and that's the way going forward the, the problem of course is that it cuts both ways you can have competitive you know liberalization but you can also have competitive populism so for example recently uh, many states have said free power to everyone uh, and one state started it and the other states emulated it so it kind of cuts both ways uh, and what one hopes is that uh, over time the guys that the states that do the good things will be the guys that deliver better and grow better and that will be the way forward first one is for the power of the box states uh, in the U.S. on the subsidy side. Exactly. <laughs> well, interesting. Is there any... Um, if not, we'll look from Stizel. I'll, I'll just say from a positive point of view, uh, as Mr. Superman pointed out, uh, there is quite large disparity in the economic growth rates between Indian states. And what you see some of the best, best Indian states doing is establishing uh, state productivity councils, looking at how they can drive productivity through all sectors of their state economy. Um, they're looking to reform labor laws. There are at least 170 different labor laws at the state level in India. Um, so there's a lot uh, positively that Indian states can do to accelerate their growth rates. Um, I just want to add to both of these and say that IP has... Oh, I'm sorry. IP has played a very small role. It's really other infrastructural labor, education, a lot of other things that's contributed to the development of the states that have done that. So I want to point back to Sean's point and Professor Flynn's point here about IP and development and the role of patents there. So I just wanted to add to that. Thank you. Um, also, along the same lines, are there big differences between states in terms of openness to foreign investment? The big difference really is in local governance and infrastructure. And it is openness not only to foreign investment, but to even domestic investment. The classic case that happened three years ago was with the new automobile factory of the Tatars, which moved from one state to another because they were more welcome in state number two as against state number one. Uh, typically, as far as U.S. Uh, investors uh, have come in over the last 10 or 15 years, they've gone to, India has about 27, 28 states. They've gone to one of three or four. So those four have been winning out again and again from a U.S. investor perspective. But we can see this both in terms of governance, quickness of approvals, minimal corruption, and in terms of uh, infrastructure. So it's, it's not a limiting effect that really is there are some substance and differences. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, this is precisely what I was going to say, that governance has made a difference, not the policies. <coughs> and uh, not only in affecting domestic investment, but even today, for instance, between Japan and the U.S., uh, there is a significant interest in the state of Gujarat, which has been attracting large U.S. investment. But Japan is now focusing again on India because that's where they find. So this competition will come within the domestic industry, between the states, and even foreign investment. But this is has to do and what has happened in India last few years is a lack of governance at the central level. It's not the policy there has been a shift or business environment has deteriorated because of policies. The deterioration is because of lack of governance and this is hurting equally the domestic industry as well as foreign investors. And some of the leading Indian industrialists they have gone on record publicly saying that they would rather invest outside India than investing in India. So it has nothing to do with any discrimination against foreign investment. And this is being corrected. This was an aberration and this is being corrected. 
in, in the most uh, recent, you know, uh, one of the big issues between the U.S. and India recently was FDI in multi-brand retail. Big point of contention. So finally, uh, India passed the law after many years, but then uh, it couldn't uh, impose it on all the states. So the way they got it through finally was to say, we, the central government, uh, adopt this position, but then we leave it to individual states whether or not they buy into this law. So, so that's another kind of funny way in which uh, this has been happening in India. So even though FDI in retail was a, was a matter that the center could decide, but because of this uh, uh, problem of you know not being able to impose this on the states, they left it up to the states. So again, some states hopefully will come up and say, we want FDI in retail because it's good for us, and, and others might not. How many places? <laughs> Just quickly to say that um, entertainment taxes on theatrical admissions continues to be a barrier both um, intrastate or I guess between the states and also as a barrier to um, foreign film distributors. Uh, you know, these very, very high entertainment taxes, which can sometimes be 70% in, in a particular, depending on the state is a huge disincentive to investing in um, both the, the activity of theatrical distribution and promotion, but also in areas like cinema construction. Um, and I, there are several examples that are in uh, my written testimony talking about also the, the tax that's been deemed unconstitutional in India by the Indian courts of charging a higher tax if the movie happens to be in a different language than that which is primarily spoken in that state. Thank you. Just, uh, Just to focus for a second on the multi-brand retail uh, foreign direct investment issue. Uh, you know, 30% of Indian agricultural production does not leave the field. And of the 70% that does, 50% does not make it to market because of the country's uh, need to improve its agricultural distribution and its retail system. Uh, permitting foreign direct investment in multi-brand retail would significantly help improve the supply chains to get food market in India, and that could certainly help the country deal with what is 20% inflation per year in food prices. So it's actually critical uh, at the state level and the national level to help them deal with these issues and try to grow. Ron? Yeah, this is a very good example of the question you asked, Mr. Chairman, because even if foreign direct investment comes in, Different states have got agricultural monopoly procurement acts, laws that they have passed. And uh, so unless each one of them gets repealed, some of this advantage will simply go away uh, in terms of getting the field closer uh, to, to the uh, supermarket, which is what foreign direct investment will hopefully do and improve the technology there. I, I, I just have a couple of things to say. Um, you know, with reference to agricultural commodity sector, I think the the larger uh, lack of agricultural, um, you know, consensus uh, on on uh, the agreement on agriculture and agreement on subsidies and countervailing measures at the WTO actually hurts many developing countries and poor countries, these developed countries, including India. So the causative factor really is the, is the, you know, when the WTO was negotiated, at least one of the thinking was many of the poorer countries like India agreed to, uh, you know, to intellectual property reforms provided the richer nations like EU and the United States agreed to reduce its agricultural subsidies because that's how the market for their products could go up, the, the agricultural products. So, uh, you know, the, yes, there are problems within states, and that goes back to infrastructure and so on and so forth. But that problem, there is also a bigger problem of concluding the agricultural negotiations at the, at the world trade level. And that would be the biggest factor that would free up some of the issues uh, in the agriculture. Well, well one of the way I can see with Robin, um, uh, so I'm sorry, I'm shaking his head. But I, it will hurt at some level, but I think it will be a great, um, it will also help a lot of these things. Good. Thank you. I don't know if the Dr. Ramakhan has got to leave at, uh, I guess, in about a half hour. Oh, got to get yeah. back up to home before the snow comes. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, as people go through, there are other questions for her. But now we turn to Commissioner Emma. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I just have one um, final question.
question. And I'm going to direct it to Dr. Subramanian, but others may want to answer as well. Um, you know, our, our staff, is, as part of the study, is, is going to be doing um, empirical work to estimate economic effects. And one of the things that we have to look at, I think, when we look at trade barriers, you, you mentioned, for example, that tariff levels on, on Indian manufactured, for Indian manufactured goods uh, are going down. Um, but those are as applied, right? Those are not bound levels. Right. And, and so, you know, businesses obviously want to operate in an environment of certainty and it, the difference between bound and applied matters to them when they make decisions about trade and investment. How do you think that our staff should take that into account in doing the empirical work that they need to do? Um, that's, a, that's a great question, uh, Commissioner. Uh, I would, you know, in the first instance, um, focus on, on the applied rates because I think, you know, the way India has done it, it's very much like the way the U.S. has done it, which is that there are no serious reversals in, you know, tariff policy of a, of a macroeconomic nature. So what India has done is that in order to alleviate pressures that come, it's increasingly resorted to anti-dumping duties, which have relatively narrow scope. Uh, but So they don't have economy-wide effects. Uh, so... so up to first order, if you want to calculate the macro effects of, of trade barriers, uh, I would go with the applied tariffs. Um, I, I, I think there's a lot of water in India's tariffs, you're absolutely right. So, so there is some uncertainty. But I think up to first order, uh, the way India has uh, dealt that is not by raising those tariffs back to, uh, uh, to, to bound levels, but in fact to relieve pressure through anti-dumping duty. So, so I think you're okay up to first order looking at applied tariffs. Does anyone else want to comment on that? Okay. All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you to the panel for all of your answers. Mr. Chairman, I'll have any further questions. Thank you. I just have a couple of questions. Um, we heard earlier uh, about uh, uh, how the uh, ITC might uh, sample firms uh, for uh, information about the impact of patent policy in India. And I'm wondering, is it possible for the ITC to quantify the impact of patent policy uh, or uh, patent enforcement policy uh, in India without relying in part on simply what business people tell us uh, the impact of that policy is? And if you can't answer here, I, I'd appreciate uh, uh, some thought uh, given to this and, and give us the information in the post here. My only submission is... Please, Mr. Shah. Uh, go for an evidence-based assessment, not perception-based. See, evidence of what has been the imports of uh, technical products how it's been growing, and whatever other data, but which must be evidence-based and not percentage-based. As I mentioned earlier, compulsory licensing we have been talking about all day. But if you see the, not only the doubling the sales of Bayer, in addition to the sales, Bayer has got 7 to 8 percent royalty income on what uh, the licensee is selling. So, what has been the net income and profit of Bayer on next hour? Use this data and we will be submitting some of these data to evaluate the impact on economy. My real submission is to go for evidence based evaluation and not perception-based evaluation. Mr. Subramanian, is it possible that some of the evidence may be the perceptions themselves, or uh, is there a way out of that box? Yeah, I, I strongly agree with what uh, Mr. Shah has said, because, you know, the whole IP thing is so contentious in India that perceptions are, you know, are, are more likely to mislead in this case more than in other cases. 
so, so, so I, I, I would urge you to do this. What I would actually, if, if I had a choice to do this, would be to look for some interesting kind of natural experiments that have happened. You know, look, for example, at, you know, maybe there are products where, you know, uh, the intensity of, of IP has increased across time or across countries. Uh, and, you know, I'm happy to discuss with your staff. Uh, you know, I have ideas for natural experiments, uh, <coughs> my friend, but uh, so, 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 so that, that would be, I think, the way forward, I think, <coughs> not the perception space thing, because in this, you know, it, quite apart from the sampling problem, there's the whole perception problem of, you know, this is highly contentious in India, highly, highly contentious. So uh, I, I, I strongly support what uh, Mr. Shah said, and I think, uh, there are some interesting natural experiments that you can, uh, that uh, uh, staff can exploit. I think. I appreciate that. Um, I, I just want to add that yes, that the, it, I, I want to support what uh, Mr. Shah and Mr. Subramanian said, uh, but I also want to look at, just take a minute to look at the, from an academic perspective. Right, historically, why did we even have the generic drug industry in India? Right, uh, in the 1950s. Uh, and, and these are all recorded with uh, um, Senator Kaufman, I believe, made a remark at the Senate basically saying, look, India, the prices in India are one of the highest in the world. And it's recorded that India said, look, we have, you know, we are a sovereign nation, we want to cater to our people, and could you reduce the cost of the drugs? And multinational companies refused, and that cost the birth of the generic drug companies. So, uh, you know, at some point, when we look at uh, you know, how uh, the country has progressed. And th this, there has been tremendous progress, especially in intellectual property and enforcement, implementation, and enactment in India. You, it, that this country has its own welfare, socioeconomic problems, uh, will inform uh, and, and help in quantifying the, the extent of policy development. So history can, can in, in some ways, help appreciate where the country is today. Dora. The, the point you made that sometimes the perception itself is in fact the evidence before the committee is it, the, the story of, of um, Monsanto and the um, patented uh, genetically modified eggplant is a very interesting one. The whole host of uh, not-for-profits, uh, environmental activists, uh, many of them funded heavily from the U.S. opposed uh, the introduction of the genetically modified eggplant. And then a couple of months later, I saw uh, substantial uh, accusations coming in from another set of not-for-profits that in fact these people were funded by chemical pesticide manufacturers who didn't want this genetically modified um, eggplant because then pesticide consumption would come down. I mean, it's lost. We don't even know what the empirical reality is because these two very contentious schools of thought have taken over the public discourse instead of it being uh, relatively rational and relatively uh, civil. Forget about rational, even civil. It's, it's like today's paper in the New York Times on the the fructose corn syrup versus the, the sugar, sugar, sugar. Sorry, yeah, it's like, it, it raised New York Times is a piece about, you know, fructose corn syrup versus the sugar industry and all the lobbying that goes behind it, so to kind of support what Mr. Ross said. I, I would ask all of the panelists to, uh, to look at this question of whether natural experiments <coughs> might be available to help test some of the, the data that we have uh, in this case, uh, and uh, put that in your post here. Submission, and if you think that that's an inappropriate uh, technique, put that in your post <laughs> submission. Uh, now, um, my last question uh, is uh, is somewhat uh, afield from what we've been discussing, but um, looking at the IT industry's ability to provide services to the financial sector in India, are there particular Indian laws or regulations that are having an impact? on the ability of the IT sector to provide services for the financial industry? I would say on balance there's no hindrance except some of the regulatory issues that I think everybody seems to be embracing 
post Lehman. Um, for instance, the KYC requirements uh, have been increased a great deal, know your customer requirements, which is making uh, outsourcing difficult for Indian banks. So they have to bring